blessing to be with you all this morning, and it's now this afternoon, and I was looking for the last two months about what scripture to use to preach on, and I thought about that time with Dale and the nine other folks that we met at my dining room table on September 19, 2001, and we prayed about starting a church that would welcome everyone because we knew that many churches say, oh, we want everyone, but then they make people feel uncomfortable when they come. And so we wanted a church that truly welcomed addicts and alcoholics, ex-offenders, sex offenders, everyone, that it would be interracial, welcoming, and affirming of everyone. And so as we were praying about this, Brandon Dean, one of our members of, at that table, brought out his Bible and he said, I have the perfect scripture to guide us. And he read it for us and it's Matthew 21, 25, 31 through 40. And it says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as a, sh a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry, and gave you food, or thirsty, and gave you something to drink? And when was it when we saw you a stranger, and welcomed you? or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them and say, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it to me. And then we all stopped and said, yes, this is the kind of church we wanna be. A church that really cares for people that loves people and helps them through life, doesn't just say, God bless you and hope you for the best, but really cares for people. And we read this as both an encouragement and a warning from Jesus. If we spend our lives trying just to make more money, we will be in a rat race. One person asked John D. Rockefeller, the wealthiest person in the nation in the first part of the 20th century, how much money was enough? And he said, one more dollar than I have. It was endless. He wanted more and more. And uh, Jim Carrey, a very famous comedian, um, said about fame and fortune, he said, I wish everyone could be rich and famous and have everything they want so that they know that it isn't enough. What is enough is having Jesus' compassion and forgiveness for everyone. And power isn't enough either. Every CEO, every pastor knows that at one time or another people are praising them for saving their church or saving their business and the next moment they're the scapegoat for when everything is falling apart and blaming them for everything. It just doesn't work looking for money or fame or power. And family, as good as family is and as important as family is, disappoints us at times. They leave us, they move away, and sometimes they even die and we're left alone. As much as we love our family, we can't make them our goal. They can't be our purpose in life. What is the purpose in life? What really matters is the love of God for us and in us and through us um, that lasts forever. 
the love of God for us, in us, and through us that lasts forever. That's what really matters. And Isaiah says it so beautifully. When asked what is the purpose of life, he says, is it not to share your bread with the hungry and to bring the homeless poor into your house when you see them naked to cover them and not to hide yourself from your own kin? <coughs> that is the purpose of life, to love other people. And this is what Jesus said 600 years after Isaiah wrote that, that he would come back and to be a judge of this world. But he doesn't come back with a list of all of our sins or a videotape of our most worst <laughs> mistakes. He comes back like a shepherd who loves his flock. And as a shepherd, he separates the sheep from the goats. Yes. Now in the Mideast, it gets very warm in the day and very cold at night. <coughs> and so, Shepherds know that sheep have these big woolly coats and they can stay out in the night and they're fine. But goats are very thin skinned and if they stay out in the night, they will catch cold and die. So the shepherd leaves the sheep on the pasture and brings the goats inside to the cave or a shelter. Now Jesus is saying that he's doing the opposite. He is bringing the sheep inside and pushing the goats outside. The sheep which are hardy and strong are coming inside and the thin skinned weak goats are left outside. He says I will the, put the sheep at my right hand. Now the right hand is an image of power as we say someone is my right hand man or right hand woman. And the left is an image of being left out. That's how we use the left. No offense to all you left-handed people. <laughs> yeah, but this is how we use it in, in English and in Hebrew also. The right side is the one of power and closeness to God. The left is being left out. And Jesus says he leaves the goats outside and um, that he will come in power to judge everyone. And that means everyone. It means Christians and Jews and Muslims and Buddhists and atheists and agnostics and everyone. When we die, we leave this time and we're whisked up before the kingdom of God. And Jesus says to us, it's not what you say, you can say, Lord, Lord, to me a hundred times, but it doesn't mean anything. It's what you do that matters. The devil knows that Jesus exists. The devil knows that God exists. It doesn't do him any good because he will not do God's will. He will not love others with God's love. And this is what we are all called to do. And this is what matters so much that God created us for a purpose in life that was to enjoy loving one another now and forever. <clears throat> and after we die, our purpose is totally fulfilled. We get to go to heaven where everyone we've ever loved is and more people to love, flooded with people to love and be loved by. This is the great joy that God wants for us. That is the hope of our life, that we can just be so filled with love that we will step from this life into eternity, loving all the way. And I saw that kind of love one day a couple of years ago when I went with uh, one of our folks, John, to visit one of our members who was struggling with alcoholism. And we knocked on her door for five solid minutes before she opened up. And when she opened up, her whole apartment was in shambles. She was half naked, just wearing a long shirt, no underwear, nothing. And we looked down her hallway, and I'm sorry to use this kind of language, but it's the only kind I can use. There was shit all down her hallway. She had had diarrhea from drinking so much. And there was crap 
all over her bathroom. And I took her aside and tried to sit down and talk with her. And as I was doing that, John went into the kitchen, got some paper towels and disinfectant, and got on his hands and knees and cleaned up all that feces that was covering her bathroom and her whole hallway. Now, I couldn't be paid to do that, but he just volunteered. And afterwards, when I said to him, that was wonderful for you to do that, he said, oh, it wasn't any problem. I just felt God wanted me to do that. I felt the Lord wanted me to do that. And I just felt so close to God when I was doing it. And we know that when Jesus said, the king will say to those on his right hand, come you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. That when we're doing it for someone else, we're really doing it for God, for Jesus. Yeah. That we don't just look at that person as themselves, but we look at them as our Lord. And we feel the Lord's love for them. And we do it not because we want to earn heaven, because Jesus tells us, inherit the kingdom. It's an inheritance something that we are given be out of love for those before us. And God gives us heaven, gives us love. We don't have to earn it. We don't have to score points. We just have to receive that love and pass it on. Give it to everyone else we meet. Just pass that love on. And Jesus says to us that this love often goes to people who are not our cup of tea. They don't look like us, they don't smell like us, they don't act like us. They are really not our kind of people at all, not someone we would feel comfortable uh, inviting to our home naturally. But Jesus says to us, those are the people who need you the most. Those are the people you will see me in the most. Those are the people who are calling you. And I will open heaven's doors for you if you do that. And so he says, then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that I saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that I saw you a stranger and when you welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, Jesus identifies with the least, with the most hurting, with the most rejected. You did it to me. And this is what it requires that we love the unlovable. We welcome those who don't look like us, don't act like us, don't even act any way we'd like to act, but we welcome them and we treat them with love and respect. Now, throughout the 22 years <coughs> of ministering here at New Beginnings, we have had many people ask us for help but the most surprising asks are from other pastors. Other pastors will call us up and say, can you help this person? And I was most surprised when an old friend of mine who was starting a church here in Charlottesville called me up and she said, Liz, I have someone I want you to help. She's an expectant mother who's in recovery from drug addiction and she lost her job and she needs rent or they're going to evict her and she can't have this baby on the streets. And she said, you know, we could help them, but we have just bought 20 acres of land and we're going to make a Christian center and a youth center and a new sanctuary. So you, 
I'm sending her to you because she's your kind of people. <clears throat> and it's no wonder we Christians have a bad reputation. Yeah, because we have the edifice complex. We prefer buildings to people. And this is the kind of priorities that Jesus says, I don't want any part of. You know, and this is why I'm so proud to be part of New Beginnings. We have always put people before our own needs. We have always given generously. Sometimes we have been on the brink of financial edge, where we have very little money left. And so we have prayed. One time at Christmas, I was with Zeke and Ed, and he said to me, I don't know what we're going to do. We don't have enough money for next month's rent. And I said to Zeke and Ed, let's just pray about it. And we prayed, and God blessed us. We got two checks and a grant in a week. And the Lord just gave us enough money for January, February, and March. <coughs> and the Lord always comes through. And we know we can trust on the Lord, just as the Lord answered Tom's prayer and was with Cindy and was with Dale. God is always with us when we depend upon the Lord and do not, do not turn against his ways. He has commanded us. This is his last sermon that he gives before he goes to the cross. The last words he has to say to us. And that is, Truly I tell you, as you did it to one of these, the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it to me. Now sometimes it isn't financial needs that people come to us for. <coughs> they come to us because they are broken. And I remember sitting here in this church with a woman who had come to me and she said, I'm just a mess. I'm in the midst of a divorce. I have been so distraught at work that my boss wants to fire me. My mom is drinking and my dad is dying of Alzheimer's. And I just don't know what to do. I try to talk to my friends and they call me a complainer. And I am just so desperate. I would just like to know that Jesus loves me. So I held her hand and said, let us just pray that you can feel the love of Jesus. And as we were holding hands, blood dripped over our hands. One drop after another drop after another drop of blood. And we both just gasped and said, Jesus is crying for us in blood. And it was only later that I realized that it was my own nose that was bleeding. <laughs> now, I never, I never have nose bleeds, and it would never come out like that. The few times I've had it, it's been gushing. But this time, it was drop after drop, and we just saw that Jesus was using my body to reach out to her, to show her that he was there for her, that he loved her. And she left there filled with the love of Jesus and saying, I know I'm going to make it now because I have experienced Jesus through you. And it's very humbling, as Sister Sandra said, to know that Jesus works through each of us, that each of us is touched by God's love. We can feel love that isn't ours, it isn't manufactured. We don't say, oh, I love this person because they're funny or they're cute or they're nice or they like me back or something. No, we love them because God first loved us and gives us this love. And we want to help them because God is in them and in us. And this is what we are all about. This is the purpose of life. It isn't money. You'll never have enough. It isn't fame. That's empty. And even Taylor Swift is going to get fat and get wrinkly one day. <laughs> and it isn't power because whoever has the power is going to be accused for messing everything up one day. 
And it isn't family as good as family is. Because our family, our kids leave us. Tom, you know this. Dale, you know this. Cindy, you know this. Our kids leave us. And the, our spouses die, and mine has died. You know, they disappoint us at times as hard as they try to please us. You know, we can't put our life's purpose in our family as much as we love them. But what we need to do is love everyone with Jesus' love and reach out to everyone. And we know that Jesus did this. He came to us on a throne full of God's glory and encircled by angels. And then he says, I took off my ermine, put my gold crown aside, laid my scepter aside, and I put on the robe of a homeless tramp. And my body had lesions, red lesions on it, and I was skin and bones, and over that robe I put on the black and white jumpsuit of an inmate, and the shackles were on my bloody ankles. And that was me who were helping, me that you came to serve, me that you shared your money and your time with, me that you prayed with, me that you loved. You were loving me to caring for them. And I was in you and in them as I am with everyone. Whenever we do to the least, to the most needy people, we're doing it for Jesus. We're doing it with Jesus, in Jesus, through Jesus, to all of us. James says, faith without works is dead. We can believe everything. And yet it's useless if we will not serve, if we do not love. It's as empty as, as a pot with no flowers or water in it. It's useless. But if faith charged with love is what will give us a life worth living, an eternal life that will be filled with love of God and love of one another. Now, one of my favorite songs that was sung at John's and my wedding is They'll Know We Are Christians by Our Love. And it was written by Peter Schultes, who was a white pastor living in the black south side of Chicago. And he even had Dr. Martin Luther King come and preach at his church. And the first thing Dr. King said to Peter after he got out of the car, do you have a cup of coffee? And Peter said, wow, more than that, I'll give you anything you want. And Peter then walked with Jesse Jackson through Parkside in near Chicago Southside. And as he walked, the uh, friends of his from high school and college stood on the uh, sidewalk and jeered at him because he was walking for integration, for empowerment of African Americans. And he was singing along with, with Jesse Jackson, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. And then Peter in 1965, after that march, went home, and in a half an hour he wrote, they'll know we are Christians by our love. He said it just burst forth from him. It was God's message to him that he needed to share with everyone. Now I know not everyone in this church here is Christian, and so I'd like you to sing, I know we are Christians by our love, by adding if you are not Christian, they'll know we are God's people by our love. Or if you're not even a believer, they'll know we are good people by our love. And Joe, would you come and lead us in that? And let us first pray while we're waiting to sing that song. Lord God, may we all give our hearts to you and live lives that are full and powerful, rich and blessed, filled with the love of family and friends, but more so filled with the love of everyone. May we give our lives to you. 
for you gave your life for us. Amen. Amen. Amen.